Along with the lark and the bark, the sound that marks the morning is this musical masterpiece, the iconic signature tune of All India Radio. Its unfailing appearance at the appointed time every morning earned it the sobriquet, airtime, with which people set their watches. The time when people didn't have timepieces, it was the radio that came to their rescue to keep pace with time. The time check at frequent intervals comes in handy for many a harried housewife with the radio playing in the background. This is All India Radio, the news. The body clock of the birdies may take a toss, but All India Radio never misses or messes with the time and tune, thanks to the unsung and unseen sentinels of the Sanctum Sanctorum. They are the engineers, announcers and duty officers who lose their sleep to wake up the world. They ensure that everything that is aired goes at the right time, tone and tenor. At times, the listeners kept vigil with radio as on the night of 14th August 1947 to usher in the birth of a new nation. This historic speech by Pandit Nehru from the Central Hall of Parliament at the stroke of midnight reverberated through the entire nation. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Voices heard on these airwaves made waves across the length and breadth of the country. Those golden voices that are forever etched in public memory have long since fallen silent. Here's one voice, though frozen in time, melts our hearts as we hear the tragic episode of the 30th January 1948. The marathon live commentary on Gandhiji's funeral by the legendary Melville de Mello, moved the nation to tears. The room was simply furnished, but the blue carpet contrasted with the white mattress upon which lay Mahatmaji. He was shrouded in spotless white khadi, from his feet to his abdomen. His chest was bare, and I could see the dark patches of the assassin's bullets against the skin of his frail body. Little did I know, as a little girl, that the magical voices would lure me to the radio. I never dreamt that the tune that turned me off as a toddler would give me a taste of life in later years, be it the classical pieces of Bach, Beethoven, Brahms. Or the inspiring speeches of Gandhiji and Nehru. When I joined this hallowed institution as an announcer in 1955, I realized that the methodical and meticulous selection process of choosing voices on radio was not based on whether we looked the part, but rather that we walk the talk and talk the talk, which no training school of today can vouch. It is a testimony of the time that people polish their diction and language skills by tuning to All India Radio. Celebrated voice and speech expert Sabira Merchant swears by the purity of the language and perfection in speech. See, that was the pivotal point of how I started my career in speech and diction, the theatre, and then subsequently television. And you know, a bit velvet voices absolutely. and great pronunciation. The V's and the W's. We yeah. learned it. I think it's, it's time to get back to learn pronunciation the right way through right. the radio. AIR had its early beginnings with the setting up of two radio stations in Bombay 
as it was called then, and Calcutta on the 23rd of July, 1927. It started its initial operation from the prestigious radio club at Colaba, subsequently moving to a government building at Queen's Road, now Marshy Road. In 1968, it shifted to its present location, popularly known then as Akashwani Theatre, for also screening award-winning films. My contemporary and colleague, Teresa Halloween, an acclaimed classical piano artist who joined the department as Western Music producer, gives a brief of the hazy history. As a little girl playing in the garden each evening, I often heard a wisp of a melody, ethereal and hauntingly beautiful. Years later, I learnt that this beautiful snatch of melody was indeed the signature tune of All India Radio. It was taken from one of the string quartets composed by Walter Kaufmann, who at one time planned and directed Western music programs at the Bombay station. It was in the 1930s that the studios were at Radio House Apollo Banda. I was delighted to participate in the children's program, a program compared by Hilda Flanders. We used to call her Aunt Hilda. We eagerly awaited the arrival of a character fondly called Daddy Long Legs. He joked with us, he gave us riddles to set us thinking, and he told us funny stories in his unimitable style. Many years later, I learned that our honored guest, Daddy Long Legs, was none other than the station director himself, Mr. Z. A. Bokhari. In time, the All India Radio Studios moved to Queen's Road, where they were housed in the Government of India Offices building. The office rooms were on the third floor, and the studios on the fourth floor. It was here in Studio One, which was allotted for Western Music Broadcasts, that the then station director, Victor Paranjoti, started a small choir. He conducted the weekly rehearsals, and with his passion and zeal for choral music, the choir grew in strength and stature, and so the Paranjoti Choir, as we know it today, was born. As station director, Victor Paranjoti asked me if I would consider joining All India Radio. It was a wish come true for me, and so in July 1948, as Teresa Atayed, I became a staff artist at All India Radio. The Bombay station of All India Radio moved into its own building at Churchgate Reclamation in December 1968, since when it proudly stands as Broadcasting House. It was from here that I retired as producer Western Music after 37 years of service at All India Radio. The Mumbai population, whether then or now, was a cosmopolitan mix, which reflected in the multilingual broadcast on All India Radio. Besides the local lingua, English broadcasts, which also included the esoteric classical Western music, were immensely popular. The sizable Anglo-Indians, East Indians and the Parsi residents were its ardent followers. This led to the formation of listeners' clubs where people gather to listen to the radio as well as exchange notes of its nuances. Unlike today, most broadcasts of those days were done live. Apart from musical recitals, they also included plays on elaborate scales with its sound effects and interludes. The legends who immortalized radio dramas were Sam Barclay Hill, Adi Marisban, Pratap Sharma, Pearl Padamsi, Sabira Merchant in English, and the inimitable P. L. Deshpande, among others, in Marathi. Sabira Merchant, who honed her skills here as a theatre personality, recalls those early days. My association with All India Radio goes back to about 1963. I remember those days so well. I happen to have met a gentleman called Adi Marsban, that huge talent. Mm. Three, I remember coming here and uh, standing in one of those studios feeling totally exposed for the first time in my life. And uh, a lot of the broadcasts were live, not um, all of them, but quite a few of them. And if you had a coughing spell, which and the people smoked in those days, so if you had a coughing spell, you just opened the door, rushed out, coughed, and came back. And it was like pin drop silence. The 
papers, because we were all standing up around uh, a table, standing up, not seated. And the papers were, had to be dropped so gently so that you wouldn't get that rustling sound and yes. go back to the mic in the same position and just swallow your sputum. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was tough and it was challenging, but uh, that, that, it, it was fun in those. It was real fun. Yeah. And you'd, everything was sign language. And then Adi would be doing the sound, like closing of the doors mm-hmm. and all those cues yeah. and the music cues. And he would just, you'd have to look at him, look at your cue at the same time, finish your word, and there it would be. It was, it was really perfect, on, honestly, it was. Unfortunately, you don't have too many of the plays around, but I think you happen to have one called The Executioner, I think, which is written by Mr. Krishnan back in those days and was directed by Adi Marjban. If you have it around, I really would love to listen to it. A train, a train roared by. I heard a paria dog wailing. I was I was dozing when I was rudely awakened by the jangle of the of the telephone placed near near my bed. Gathering my Wits and chasing away the mist of drowsiness, I, I said, uh, uh, hello, hello, who, who is it? Hello, uh, hello. And who was it? For, for, for a moment, a stillness on the other end, followed by, followed by deep. Deep laughter. <laughs> and then the, the line went dead. It was not only plays but other games too that were broadcast on radio. Sports coverage took All India Radio centre stage with its running commentaries on cricket, hockey, football at the national as well as the international level. The catch of the season was the weekly sports roundup popularized by AFS Dalia Khan. Seasonal commentator Suresh Saraya, who still makes a pitch for wide coverage of sports on radio, speaks of the League of Gentlemen. Starting about the sports commentaries, I think uh, cricket was the first one which was broadcast by All India Radio way back in 1934, the first quadrangular match between Hindus and Europeans played at uh, Bombay Jivankhana was broadcast and the solo broadcaster was none other than A.F.S. Talyar Khan known in short words Bobby Talyar Khan but just before him unofficially Bombay Radio there was a private radio station also did a small stint of running commentary and Colonel S.B. Setna who was the director shared the microphone, that's the story goes, but he claims that he was the first broadcaster. There are many who do remember that way back in 1934, it was the Bombay Station, the quadrangular match was the first one which was broadcast live by All India Radio. And since then, it is Bobby Talyar Khan with his voice, with his style, with his deep knowledge of the game, with his wit and wisdom. He knew every aspect of the game. He never ever needed a statistician around him. Can you imagine and believe that for five and a half hours, this man was giving ball by ball commentary and it's on record. So whenever radio was giving ball by ball running commentaries, half the number of spectators chose to remain at home and listen to Bobby's voice. But when you talk about cricket commentaries also, Vijay Merchant, way back in 1956, ever since he took over both as an expert commentator, Narodham Puri's father, Devraj Puri from Delhi, we had Berry Savadikari, and then Pearson Surita, the booming voice from Eden Gardens, Kolkata. When one heard Pearson Surita, one thought for a while that here is a man who would match Bobby Dalyar Khan for word for word, for style, for passion that he must have for the game, 
team. He was a permanent fixture at Inn Gardens, Kolkata. So was Vijay Merchant. So was Dikki Ratnakar. I now distinctly remember in 1974-75 and what a series that one was against Lloyd's West Indies. At the end of the fourth test match, India and West Indies were leveled at two all and the final test match at Bombay was a six-day affair for the first time in the history of Indian cricket and Tiger Patodi was India's captain. Well, Pat, how did you rate India's cricket chances before the series began and what are your impressions about the series? We realised that the West Indies was a strong team. They had some pretty powerful batting and fairly aggressive opening bowling. But we also felt that in our conditions, in Indian conditions and given specific conditions, uh, that is the slow turning wickets that we tend to get here, that we could do well against them. And I think this was shown in fact. We won in Calcutta and Madras because the wicket suited us and we won the toss. And our spinners are of course top class. But again, I don't think there have been many uh, problems solved in this series because we still have this lack of opening bowling, this lack of middle order and a lack of an opening batsman. Apart from a couple of youngsters who came up and did well, I think really that you know we must get down more seriously in, in uh, finding these deficiencies which the Indian team still has, I feel. At a time when the cassettes did not come home and the outings were not the in thing, it was the radio that entertained people. It truly served a variety of fare with variable formats like plays, features, interviews, discussions, news and the joie de vivre of all, music. Great maestros from the music world regaled the audiences through All India Radio. Many struggling artists who later became legends, All India Radio was their claim to fame. Rare recordings of Ustad Bade Ghulam Ali Khan, Begum Akhtar, Ustad Alauddin Khan and others have become the exclusive domain of All India Radio. Some of these in recent years have been marketed through our radio stations on public demand under the series Amritvani. Now here's Begum Akta to get a taste of the timeless melodies. <laughs> It was not only the connoisseurs, but also the untutored who had their share of the variety fair. Special programs for the special audiences, as they are called here, made sure that neither the old nor children were out of its ambit. Arun Kovka, noted filmmaker, traces his talent to the early beginnings on radio as a child artist. I have a very long association with the All India Radio going back to the 50s when well-known Marathi writer Mr. P. L. Deshpande was working on All India Radio as a producer. He tried to bring classics of Marathi literature to radio and I had played the main lead in one of the serials based on Mr. Srina Prince's novel Hatya, which had become extremely popular. And uh, many years later, when I started making films, I realized that you know, radio had taught me the importance of sound. And I think sound has always been a very important component of cinema for me. And I think I definitely owe it to the All India Radio. And later, I think uh, this national programs of Indian classical music as well as Western classical music, I think uh, one got to listen to some of the best music produced in India and in the West as a result of those programs. And also radio is rather a relaxed medium. It's not uh, like television where you have to be in front of it. So in that sense, I think radio still retains a great deal of importance. It's accessible in any place, anywhere in the world. AIR provided the platform to the experts as well as the amateurs. Many amateurs, in fact, owe their expertise to the early groomings at radio. The debutante, Dolly Thakur, became the diva of the media fraternity through a journey started 40 years ago. She nurtured her multifaceted skills as an actor, 
writer, interviewer and narrator at the radio. My romance with radio started when I was 10 years old and I always loved those speaking voices of, and all the Western classical music. So I began to be interested in that through uh, the music and got to n- know the names of the presenters. So there was uh, Praminda Premchand and there was Hamid Sayani. The first time I entered radio station was AIR Lucknow. In a play that I was taking part in for the youth festival, I was just 15 when I went, and it was called Trikorn Ka Chotha Korn, uh, written by Gyandio Agnihotri, who then became very big in the film industry. There were auditions being held in Delhi, so I went for my All India Radio audition. And in those days, it used to be very particular. You had to pronounce every word. They used to give you a script. And who were the other two people with me also auditioning? Kabir Bedi. And uh, I can't remember whether it was Amitabh Bachchan or his brother Banti. You know, so all three of us were auditioning for it. People whose names I only thought were legends, like Melville de Mello, Pravinder Premchand, Amin Siani, Hamid Siani, Pearson Surita, Sam Barkley Hill. These were just legends in those days, but I worked with each one of them and interacted with all of them. So it feels wonderful to be able to, I mean, when I first entered All India Radio to be doing programs that they were doing, I, I can't tell you what a great thrill that was. Amazing the kind of following I got from people. People just recognized you by your voice. Even today, I have to pick up a telephone when, when the system of not direct dialing, international direct yeah. dialing or STD was not there. So you called the operator and they would immediately say, Ab Dolly Thakur yeah, Bulring. Yeah. And you felt so thrilled. <laughs> and I right, love those kind right. of things. I'm very proud to say that I'm a product of uh, All India Radio, Films Division. And when uh, Doordarshan came in, then Doordarshan. I've had great fun doing all these interviews. I interviewed very many important people on uh, All India Radio. I did Vijay Merchant. Uh, He was an amazing person. And in fact, that particular interview has been used by the Jamia Ismaili, I think, to teach their students how to conduct an interview. It is often believed that children good in sports do not excel in academics. Would you say that applies to you also? Were you not so interested in studies? I was very much interested in studies, Dolly. But life was different then. You could play for six months cricket or any other game. And for the other six months, you never had a sight of a cricket ball. It's not so these days. These days, your cricket season spreads from the 1st of June to the 31st of May. And every game has become so professionalized that those who are good at games just cannot find time for studies. Vijibhai, would you say that because you came from a privileged Thakase family that you didn't have to spend time studying and doing well in school and college like other children would have done? Dolly, the university does not take con- cognizance of the fact that you come from a rich family. You have to write your papers, you have to do well in your examinations. Till what standard did you study, Vijibhai? I went up to become of the Bombay University. I see. And you were able to concentrate on studies and cricket at the same time. That's very remarkable. I've given you the reason. Six months of cricket and six months of studies. I wish we could have that choice too. People celebrated the success in a sport or a film through these sound bites. The celebrities knew the standing of the radio, hence did not hesitate to open up. Some of them even bared their soul to us through the oral biographies recorded under the series Archival Recordings with the rider that they will be broadcast only after their demise. The biographies preserved for posterity include those of J.R. D. Tata, Durga Khote, Ashok Kumar, among many others. There is red light in the rubies, there is blue light in the skies, but nothing is, is more wonderful than light in honest eyes. As I say, when I show them, I do it, people enjoy it. 1966. I came back for, uh, from an uh, from, uh, operation from Boston. It was a very big operation on the stomach. And uh, then I was lying down one year, one and a half year doing nothing. Lying on the bed, stitches were there, doctors were attending. He said, why don't you paint? I said, I don't want to paint. I said, I'll teach you. I said, what do you want to Then he said, I'll, I'll, I'll draw the figures, you color them. I used to color them. Color them, color them. From that he got interested. Color karte karte and I started painting. So 1966 was After that, my, many people have taken my, my paintings from here and there, everywhere. 
Not that they'll be good, but my name is written there, Ashok Kumar. <laughs> I felt wonderful also bringing to life many voices hidden from the public gaze. The treasures in our library include international celebrities on their stopover here in Bombay, like Pearl Buck. Yesterday morning, when I was having my breakfast, I took up the paper, as usual, and the first item I saw was the announcement of Robert Frost's death. My mind went back to the time I last saw him, which was only a few weeks ago, when we were at a dinner uh, together. On that occasion, he seemed especially well. He was 88 years old, but his mind was fresh. He was humorous. He recited his poems. He seemed like a man of 60 or 65. He looked his age, uh, but he wasn't his age. Robert Frost had the unusual experience of seeing his career mount higher and higher and higher as he grew older. Perhaps that's because poets are perennially young. They never grow old. At least Robert Frost did not. Neil Armstrong. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for us to be here today at this magnificent welcome in the city of Bombay. And George Harrison. Naturally, with being a Beatle and all that, I've naturally still wanted to carry on making the Beatle music because, mm -hmm. but I won't be able to play proper classical Indian for maybe a lot of a long time, but I can still use little things that I do learn and involve them in our music to make our music. If the youngsters of today, like the popular playback singer Gajri Ganjawala, recommends radio for a wholesome entertainment, it is a definite proof that one can never have a fill of a choice's spread. I've uh, grown up listening to All India Radio as a child. You know, it holds very, very fond memories for me. Right from the beginning, I've tuned in to All India Radio to listen to everything from uh, Indian classical music to uh, Western music to uh, regional music to uh, every form of music possible and to commentaries and to everything uh, that was medium wave and then the FM channels. I also remember performing for the All India Radio when I was in school and I used to sing uh, English songs of my favourite artists. And I also remember coming uh, to sing classical music at the All India Radio, come there twice to sing uh, some bandishes and khayals. And uh, over the years, uh, with the advent of radio in such a big way, there have been uh, several uh, FM, FM channels uh, on the air. But uh, I still think All India Radio has uh, one of the best FM channels and the music that they play is one of the best. And uh, even now I tune in to the, the late night radio that plays. And uh, some of the English music that plays on, on the All India Radio is by far the best for me. So I always will have a special place in my life. As I return to the studio after two decades to catch up with you, I realize that among the choicest jobs in those days, and even now, is that of a broadcaster. And I feel proud that I was the chosen one. As your senses today respond to your typical caller tune, my senses stay alert to the signature tune of All India Radio. <laughs> 